We're going to be talking today about how Jesus looked. You ever wonder about that? How Jesus looked? Well, we're not talking about Jesus' physical appearance. We're talking about how Jesus looked at people. At Jesus looking at people around Him. In the stories recorded for us in the Bible. A bunch of verses that specifically describe Jesus looking at somebody. And it's like we're supposed to imagine the scene that's portrayed for us there. We're supposed to imagine the Lord Jesus interacting with people and how He looked at them and what that meant and what was going on in His heart, what was going on in their heart and what He did next. And so today we're going to look at seven stories from the Gospels of how Jesus looked at people. Can you imagine what it was like to look into the eyes of Jesus? I mean, surely that was different than looking in the face of any other human being. Surely you saw in the face of Jesus something beyond this world. (laughs) Something beyond. Of, of, a, of a heavenly, divine glory about the Lord Jesus. And so these are examples of Jesus looking at people. And though Jesus is in heaven now and we can't see Him, you know what? He's still looking at us. <laughs> He's still looking at you and me today. He's watching us. He's concerned about all that's affecting us. And what we'll see in these stories is Jesus doesn't just observe the situation, but, but often in the story, Jesus does something. He, he addresses the situation. He takes action. And remember, too, that, that Jesus is our example of how to live as perfect people. <laughs> he was perfect in every way, and we're called to follow in His footsteps And so in many cases, we look at others the same way the Lord Jesus looked at people. We're supposed to. We can imitate our Lord. So we'll go through these seven examples, these seven little stories of Jesus looks. And and just turn to one scripture for each one from the Gospels. So the first example, the first little story is how Jesus looked with compassion at suffering people. He looked with compassion on those who suffered. And and we can turn to this in in, in Luke chapter 7 will be our example. There's actually multiple stories of this. But Luke 7, beginning at verse 12, said, And as he approached the gate of the city, this is the city of Nain, a dead man was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So this is the scene, okay? This, this, this poor woman has already buried her husband. She's already a widow, and now she's lost her, her only son. And she's absolutely broken over it. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, there's his look, when he saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her do not weep and he came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt and he said young man I say to you arise and he raised that that dead man from the dead right on the spot so here's this poor lady who is so full of sorrow and and Jesus is observing this tragic scene right And he understands what's going on, and he feels compassion, and he takes action. First comforting the mother, he says, do not weep, and then healing her son. I love to think about this basic pattern here. Jesus sees the suffering, he understands what's happening, he feels compassion, he comforts the sufferer, and then he fixes the problem. And he does that again and again and again. And, and you see that sa- similar pattern in, in other stories of Jesus healing. He sees it, he feels compassion, he acts. 
to address it. Why well, I, I apply this little story to myself in two ways. I mean, one is in my prayers that that it's, it should be very encouraging for us when we pray for sick people and suffering people. We, we pray for them every day, right? When we pray for, for sick and suffering people to know that the Christ we pray to is this same Christ. He's the Christ who looked on sad, tragic situations and He felt something. He was compassionate. But not just, did he, not just feelings, right? But then He acts. <laughs> he acts not only to comfort the sufferer, but to fix the problem. To heal the sickness. So it should encourage us in prayer. But also, I want to have a tender heart like Jesus towards people's suffering. I want to be like Jesus in this. I, when I see people suffering, I want to be moved with compassion, right? I, I don't want to just live in a little selfish bubble of comfort, right? Where I'm not moved by the sorrows around me. Jesus was caring and ready to help. I want to be that way too. Well, the second little story, the second example is kind of a contrast to this. It's a story about Jesus' anger. Jesus looked with anger at some people. In this case, it was hard-hearted religious people. We read about them in Mark chapter 3. If you turn back to the, to the Gospel of Mark, Mark 3, in verse 1. He entered again into a synagogue. And a man was there whose hand was withered. And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, that's to the the religious guys that are watching this scene. He says, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. They were afraid to answer. And after looking around at them, there's his look, looking around at them with anger, it says, grieved, also grief mixed in, grieved at their hardness of heart. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. These religious people, these Pharisees, they had no compassion for the suffering guy. Right? They're just the opposite to, to how Jesus was. Jesus has compassion for the suffering. They didn't care about the suffering guy. The suffering guy was just a pawn for them. They're just using him to try to make Jesus look bad. Make Jesus look like a Sabbath breaker. And he calls them on it. He, he understands what they're doing. He calls them out. They've got no answer. And so verse 5 says he just looked around at these guys with anger. Grieved at their hardness of heart. Can you imagine looking into Jesus' eyes when He's angry at you? I mean, you'd think that would just melt anybody. I mean, anybody would just be broken in repentance and say, I'm in trouble here. But these guys are so hard-hearted, it says that they're unmoved by that. We all know by experience that most human anger gets us into trouble. Most human anger leads directly to sin. But, it, but it's clear here that, that not all anger is sinful. Jesus had an anger that was pure and holy here. And we should be angry about the same things that Jesus was angry about. That's right. There are some things we should be angry over. In this case, Jesus was angry about religious leaders using suffering people for their own purposes rather than trying to help them with their need. A third example of Jesus' looks is that He looked with welcome at new converts. He looked with welcome to new converts, those wanting to become Christians. And John it starts out his Gospel telling about how some of the first disciples became Christians. And if you turn, turn to the Gospel of John now, to John chapter 1, we'll read about that. 
John 1 and verse 40. It says, One of the two who heard John speak. So this is talking about John the Baptist. Just a few verses before, John the Baptist had, had, had made this, this wonderful declaration about Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he says two of the guys who heard John say that, or one of the two who heard John say that, followed Jesus. And we're told that his name was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41, he found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. So Andrew brings his brother, Simon, he brings him to Jesus. We found the Messiah. Come and see him. Brings him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him. For the first time he probably ever laid eyes on him, he looked at him and he said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So can you imagine that first look when the Lord Jesus first saw Simon? Simon's coming along, probably skeptical. You know, what's this deal? What does my brother know anyway? But he comes along to meet, and immediately Jesus looks at him and doesn't just look at him but Jesus surely knew something that this this Simon was an important guy this this Simon was going to become one of his best friends that this Simon was going to lead his fledgling church and so just immediately Jesus changes his name says you're going to be called Peter you're going to be called Cephas from here on a name that means rock when you talk to a family member about the gospel, some of you have been doing that over the holidays here. When you talk to a family member about the gospel, you're trying to do what Andrew did, right? You're trying to bring along your brother, bring along your sister, bring along your parent, bring along your nieces and nephews and grandkids. And bring them along to Jesus. Say, I found the Messiah and I want you to know him too. And so uh, we do that. We want to bring our friends and loved ones to Jesus. We want to introduce them to Jesus. Well, you can be confident that if they go to Jesus, they'll be well received by Jesus. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry that they're going to be disappointed. You don't have to worry that Jesus will treat them bad. No, no. Andrew brings his brother, and immediately Jesus is ready. <laughs> He's ready for Simon Peter. He's ready to, to look on him with welcome. Change his name, bring him in, in a very personal way to be his disciple. Another new convert example along this line, this one's even better known. You kids probably all know this story. The story of Zacchaeus. Do any of you kids know the story of Zacchaeus? Anybody? Okay. Got a few kids, a few kids. All right. Oh, Zacchaeus was a bad guy. I mean, you don't realize that maybe in the story, but it says he was a chief tax collector and very rich. Why was he rich? Because he'd been stealing money from people, like, for years. Everybody hated Zacchaeus. He was a bad guy. He knew it. But he heard Jesus was coming through, and he was curious, at least, about Jesus. And it says he was... Small in stature. That's what kids probably remember about him. He was small in stature. There's a big crowd there. And so he, what did he do? He went and climbed up in a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus as Jesus walked along the road there. And we used to be expecting Jesus to just kind of walk on past and, and he'd say, yep, I saw this Jesus that's so famous now. But instead Jesus stops and comes over to his tree. And it says, it's a, this is the language, this is in... Uh, it's in Luke 19, if you want to look it up. It says, Jesus looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down. Come down from that tree. Hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So Jesus doesn't just look at him, but Jesus invites himself into Zacchaeus' life. He calls him to himself. Says, come down from that tree. I'm, I'm staying with you now. Jesus, Jesus singles out the worst guy in town. 
and welcomes him as a disciple. What a look of love Zacchaeus must have seen when Jesus came over to his sycamore tree. And it seems like he was just saved right there on the spot when Zacchaeus encountered Jesus. Well, praise God that that Christ is still doing that. Christ is still is still looking for. He's still singling out specific people. Just like, just like he singled out Simon, singled out Zacchaeus. He looked at him. He interacted with him personally. And Jesus still does that as he saves people today. He welcomes sinners to himself with grace, calling them to salvation. If, if you are a Christian today, do you, do you remember when, when you first encountered the Lord Jesus? <laughs> do you remember when you had the sense that He's looking at me? He's caring about me here. He sees me. He loves me personally. I belong to Him. He wants me to be His. When He dealt with us in that same unique, warm, personal way that we see in the Gospels. Well, then the fourth story is kind of a contrast to that one. The fourth story is about a man who did not end up getting saved. It's a story about a man who rejected Jesus. He seemed close to being saved, but he doesn't get saved. So the story kind of turns out bad. We can turn to Mark chapter 10. Read about it. This is known as the story of the rich young ruler. Mark 10, verse 17, says, As he, so Jesus, as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him. I mean, this guy's enthusiastic, at least, right? He runs up, he kneels down, he looks humble, he looks like he's teachable. He says, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's a real good question. That's a real good question to ask. How do I get to heaven? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus immediately discerns the guy doesn't understand what real goodness is, what real righteousness is. And so he he goes right after that. But then he he proceeds. He says, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him to Jesus teacher I have kept all these things from my youth up he claimed perfect righteousness in his own obedience so he was clearly mistaken about that but then look at what Jesus does in verse 21 it says looking at him Jesus felt a love for him Jesus looks at him, feels love for him, and says to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words he was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus looking around, Luke's account says he, Jesus specifically looked at the guy as he's walking away. Jesus said to his disciples how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. So here's a guy that Jesus specifically invites to be saved. He spells out, here's, you can follow me. Here's what I want you to do first. This guy was self-righteous. And this guy ends up rejecting Christ. Christ. And flat out choosing his money rather than choosing Jesus. He made a horrible, tragic choice that day. A a choice he's probably regretted for all eternity. Unless unless he changed his mind later and was saved, that's possible. But as far as we know, this is all we know with the story. That he went away lost. He went away choosing money over Jesus. That's a horrible thing he did. And yet Jesus looks at this guy in his self-righteousness, in his love for his idols, with his Christ-rejecting heart. He looks at him how? With love. He looks at him with love. He loves him. Even as he is telling him the high cost of discipleship. 
Jesus cares about the plight of perishing sinners, even those who love their idols so much they reject the gospel. There's love in the heart of Jesus for lost people. Oh, brothers and sisters, we must be like our Lord in this way. When we try to evangelize people, when we, we try to witness to somebody, whatever the setting is, whether it's you know some kind of street witnessing, some of you guys do that, some of you guys knock on doors around the neighborhood, some of you just, just witness to people in your family, or you, or you meet your friend at a coffee shop and you try to talk about the Lord with them. In each of those settings, we've got to be like Jesus in this. We've got to look on that lost person with love. They've got to see love in our eyes when we share with them. Even, even if they're not that interested. Even if, they're, even if they're rejecting Christ and rejecting the gospel. Will they at least realize we love them? As Jesus was that way. I, I often go into those kind of situations and I'm thinking more about, do I have all the right arguments? <laughs> you know, do I have all the right Bible verses to say? I think this thing of love is probably more important than the, those, those worries of, of this thing or that thing. All of us know enough to share the gospel with someone. But the, the question is, do we have love for them like Jesus did? It's so essential for evangelism. A fifth thing, a fifth example is in regard to giving. It says Jesus looked with discernment at givers' contributions. And we have this story in Luke chapter 11. If you'd like to turn there, Luke chapter 11. And verse, sorry, Luke chapter 21. I think I said the wrong thing. Luke chapter 21. And verse 1. It says, He looked up and saw the rich. So there he's looking. He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw, so he's looking again, and he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they all out of their surplus put in into the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. There around the temple area, there was a, there was a, there was a place where, where you, could, you could go and make financial donations to like poor people and, and different causes. I think it's like they had big chests there with a slot in it. You could, you could, put, in, you could put in donations. And, and so Jesus and his disciples were, were kind of around that area in the temple. And, and, and so I guess they were watching these different people come through and, and, and put their gifts into those 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 money chests and 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 Jesus seizes on this as a teaching opportunity and and as they are watching these people give Jesus makes a real big point about how we value giving and what true generosity is he points out that God does not value our giving the same way people value things I mean, how do we think in terms of how big a gift is, right? I think in terms of how big is the number on the check, <laughs> all right? I think in terms of how valuable that, that object is that somebody gives you. You know, what could that be sold for? What's its fair market value? But that is not the way God values things. Jesus shows that he is looking much deeper than at the number. <laughs> He's looking at the heart of the person. He's looking at the circumstances of the person. He's looking at their actual sacrifice, their actual faith going on in the process of their giving. Jesus cares about the degree of sacrifice involved. When those, when those rich guys were coming through, giving out of their surplus, Jesus knew that wasn't hurting them at all. They weren't sacrificing anything. They weren't going to have to change their plans at all because of the gifts they were making. 
But that poor, poor widow sure was. I mean, she's given all that she had. I mean, where, where, was, where was she going to buy food for the next day? You know? And Jesus also notices the amount of faith required in our giving. I mean, here's this, this poor lady. She's putting in all that she had to live on, it says. I mean, that took a big time trust in God. That God, you're, you see me, you're going to take care of me somehow. If I, give, if I give my last two pennies here, you're going to take care of me some other way. She really trusted God. Those rich guys didn't really have to trust God the same way. And so Jesus says that because of her sacrifice and her faith, the two pennies were actually a bigger gift than, than the wads of cash <laughs> that, that those rich guys were laying down. That's God's different than ours, isn't it? I mean, we've just, just talked a minute ago about, about the, the experience of giving that we've just been through. And, and I, I, I'm sure Zach could, could tell us that there were all different sizes of donations received. Um, but in God's eyes, the, the, the checks with the biggest numbers weren't necessarily the biggest gifts. Right? God sees the whole circumstance of our lives. He sees our hearts. He discerns the whole picture. And be assured that God sees our secret giving and knows what it's really costing you. That's a real comfort. You know, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount back in Matthew 6, He says, when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, keep it as private and secret as you can. He goes on, so that your giving will be in secret and your Father who sees in secret, or sees what is done in secret, will reward you. God sees it. Nobody else knows. Nobody else knows what it cost you. Whatever. But God sees it. And God will reward you. Nobody outgives God, is the old saying. It's true. On to number six. Sixth example. It says that Jesus, it's a story of how Jesus looked with conviction at a believer's sin. And in this story, we're going back to Peter. We talked about a few minutes ago when Peter was saved when he first came to Jesus. This is about three years later when Peter really failed. He denied the Lord three times while Jesus was nearby being interrogated. It's a terrible thing. Well, here's how Luke describes the end of the story. If you, if you want to just turn about one page to Luke chapter 22 and verse 60. We'll just pick it up right at the end of the story. He's, he's, already, he's already denied the Lord twice and here comes number three at verse 60. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed the Lord turned and looked at Peter there's the look and Peter remembered the word of the Lord how he had told him before a rooster crows today you will deny me three times and he went out and wept bitterly can you imagine Peter's position he had, just, he had just failed so horribly, badly. I mean, denying that he even knew who Jesus was. Failing Jesus at the time when Jesus was in the, you know, the worst situation. He'd just been arrested. He's being interrogated. He's about to be crucified. And Peter totally fails there. And then he hears the rooster crow. And he remembers Jesus earlier that day and said, Peter, you will deny me three times today before the next... The next rooster makes noise and, and then he sees Jesus himself. Maybe Jesus was on the other side of a courtyard. Maybe the soldiers are taking him from one place to another. But Jesus, as Peter is denying the Lord, as the, as the rooster is crowing, it's like Peter hears the rooster, Jesus hears the rooster, and Jesus turns and looks at Peter. It doesn't say he said anything to Peter. It just says he looked at him. 
And that look was enough to totally devastate Peter, wasn't it? He smashed with conviction at the terribleness of his sin. And it says he went out and wept bitterly. Bitter tears of sorrow, of failure, repentance hopefully. And then can't you imagine over the next several days, how many times Peter in his mind replayed that look of Jesus. I mean that was the last, that was the last he saw of Jesus probably. Until the crucifixion. And, and, and thinking, here, this is the last, the last Jesus saw me. And as he sees him crucified, as he sees him buried. But then soon it's resurrection morning. And soon Jesus comes to Peter and restores him with such grace and such comfort. But I'm just thinking about that look there. Jesus looking at Peter. Right in the midst of his sin. And, and, and to me the application is just obvious. That I need to remember that the Lord Jesus sees all my sins too. <laughs> the Lord Jesus sees my sin. Right in real time. Right as I'm doing it. Just the same way he looked at Peter. Thou God seest me. Now I do, I do some sins that nobody knows about. Right? I can keep them secret. can keep them in my heart. Whatever. But the Lord Jesus is looking right at me. He sees it. He knows, he knows the score. He knows what's happening. And in Peter's case, it's the same with me. I do not sin against a law. I don't just sin against a standard that I'm coming short of. But I sin against a person. I sin against the one who gave that law. Who set that standard. Who called me to holiness. I sin against the person. What person? The person of Christ. The Lord Jesus. Who loved me more than anybody else has ever loved me. And he's given the ultimate sacrifice for me. To save me. The biggest way. Here I am. Doing some rotten thing. Sinning against the Lord. And if I had any sense. That thought would be enough to break me. Like it broke Peter. To be immediately humbled. To weep. To ask the Lord to forgive me. I ought to feel the same shame as Peter. And repent as quickly as Peter repented. And then receive Jesus' restoration. Like Jesus so mercifully restored Peter. Last one. The seventh example is how Jesus looked with tears at people facing God's judgment. This is quite a story. It, it happens just a bit earlier in, in Luke. Just, I don't know, just within a few days of the crucifixion. Luke 19 and verse 41. It says, when He approached Jerusalem. So Jesus is traveling into town, into Jerusalem from another town. It says he saw the city. There's Jesus look. He saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Jesus was anticipating prophetically events that happened about 37 years after this, when the armies of the Roman Empire came and surrounded the city of Jerusalem, laid siege to it, eventually, eventually got inside the city walls and destroyed the city and obliterated the temple and thousands and thousands and thousands of people died in really horrible ways. 
And Jesus could foresee this coming prophetically. And he says the reason why God was about to punish the city so violently is there at the end of verse 44. He says, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. What's he mean? Well, somebody had just visited them. (laughs) The Messiah who had been predicted for so many centuries, finally came. He finally shows up. He finally visits. The incarnate Son of God is on the scene. And rather than welcoming Him, they are rejecting Him. And in a few days after this, they they are going to crucify Him. And right before He's crucified, there is an angry mob of people around Pilate there saying, crucify Him, crucify Him, crucify Him. Turn loose Barabbas the murderer. We want Jesus to be crucified. They didn't recognize that visitation. And so there's no question that Jerusalem deserved punishment, deserved judgment. They've done a horrible thing in rejecting Christ. Jesus, of course, knew all those things. And yet, get this, when He sees the city that day, the city that was, that was about to do all this, when He sees the city that He knew deserved judgment, when He sees the city, He does not curse them. He does not just coldly say, well, they deserved it. They're getting what they ought to get. Because they've been rotten to me. But he weeps. He weeps over the city of Jerusalem. There's mercy. There's compassion in his heart. Toward this wicked city that deserved judgment. Listen, if you're not a Christian today, then you are living right now under judgment, under under the holy wrath of God. As John talked about earlier, you should be fearful of that. Judgment is coming on everyone that's outside of Christ, just as certainly as judgment came upon Jerusalem there. It's coming, it's certain. But Jesus Christ is not gleeful about that fact. He's not gleeful that judgment's coming on anybody. On the contrary, surely He still looks upon you and upon any perishing sinner with the same heart that He shows here as He weeps over the wicked city of Jerusalem in anticipation of judgment. Peter himself in his second epistle says says that God is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That is a reflection of the heart of the Lord toward lost people. Yes, if you don't become a Christian, you will be judged. You will be punished. You will be put in hell forever. The Bible says that Jesus taught that. But Christ wants you to be saved. He does not want to have to put you in hell someday. And so please go to Him now. Go to Him now in repentance and faith. And He will welcome you. He will save you. Like we already talked about. Like He did for Zacchaeus. Like He did for for Simon Peter. He will welcome you and save you. He will receive you with mercy. We've got to have a place in our theology for Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. If that doesn't fit into your theology, then you need to adjust your theology a little bit. Because this shows something that's really important about the Lord. And hopefully it informs us and how we should view lost people too with the same heart Jesus had. Well, I hope these seven examples, these seven little stories have given us a clearer picture of how Jesus looked. We talked about how Jesus looked at suffering people. 
He looks with compassion upon them and then acts to help them. We have saw how Jesus looks at, at hard-hearted, self-righteous, religious people. He looks with anger on them, at least some of the time. We see him how he looks at new converts with welcome, acceptance. We, we also saw how he, how he looked at the rich young ruler who was, who was rejecting him and choosing his money instead. And, and Jesus even loves that guy. And then we, we talk fifth, fifthly about how, how Jesus looks at the givers and discerns the true value of the sacrifices we make for him. And, and then, then we thought about Peter there and, and how Jesus looked, brought conviction over his own sin. Just as we as believers can take that to heart. And then finally, we looked at his tears toward Jerusalem, toward this wicked city. And I don't know for you this, what, it, what it means, but for me, this simple little study of putting these things together has warmed my heart. I mean, it's just shown me in a fresh way what a wonderful, warm, personal, emotional, caring Savior we have. He's not cold and distant or mechanical or... He's personal. He's tender. And, and, and folks, He's still the same way today. It says there in Hebrews that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jesus you read about in these gospel stories, same Jesus today. Right? Now he's been crucified, he's been resurrected, he's, he's, he's living in heaven now, but he's the same Jesus. You know his heart's the same, the attitude there is the same, and so these stories give us insight into the Christ we love and worship. He's really the same way we see him in these stories here, the same way he looks at these people. Back 2,000 years ago, he also looks at us and the situations around us. And so my encouragement, my exhortation to, to us all, if, if maybe one or two of these examples really moved your heart somehow, kind of, kind of, kind of tugged at your heart, then, then I'd encourage you to grab a hold of that. You know, grab a hold of that thought, that one aspect of Christ that, that maybe stood out to you this morning. And really meditate on that. Really think about that. Investigate that. Maybe find some more... Bible verses that kind of go along with that thought. And see the reality of Christ in a fresh way in that particular area. Let Him become more real and precious to you. That's what we need, isn't it? We need to see Jesus as He is. May God help us to do that. Through the revelation we have in His Word.